Times had been particularly flagrant. Take a look at the Times crossword puzzle. The clue is the same for numbers 39 and 43 across. Lead story in tomorrow's newspaper. 39 across, Clinton. 43 across, elected. But surely the Times wouldn't go out on a limb like that. No, the crossword editor is much too diabolical. So rearrange a few words and the answer to 39 and 43 across is Bob Dole elected. When we come back, one of the other presidents in the world to whom we pay enormous attention, Boris Yeltsin, he had surgery today. campaign. He had four Republican opponents, and one of them was Steve Forbes, who spent $41 million. In fact, this will be the most expensive national campaign ever when you count the spending by the national political parties and the presidential candidates and the congressional candidates. The price tag is $2 billion. Most of the money came from business. Just look at, for example, the financial sector, the banks and real estate and insurance. Those industries poured in $60 million in the first 18 months of the campaign. And then there were the outside groups, like, for instance, the labor unions, which spent $35 million on a so-called nonpartisan educational campaign that was, in fact, aimed at defeating Republican congressmen. And the tobacco industry handed out buckets of money to fight Bill Clinton, the most anti-smoking president in history. Big Tobacco spent at least $7 million, and 81% of their money went to the Republicans. So the system that is supposed to regulate campaign contributions simply broke down this year. Huge $100,000-plus contributions from corporations and rich people and labor unions rolled in. And the Democrats' failure to investigate where some of that money was coming from may turn into a scandal that follows Mr. Clinton into the next term. Dan? Thanks, Linda. On Wall Street, analysts said today that the street was betting on the status quo, that President Clinton would be re-elected and the Republicans would hold on to Congress. On the basis of that, apparently the Dow is up more than 39 points. But because or anything of this course, we're talking about we're talking about consistency of view and adhering to one's political conviction rather than flip flopping one day after another. That's character. But when all of these assaults on on character are outlawed in the interest of something called civil discourse, uh, and and it and essentially utterly phonying up of the, uh, the whole nature of this political discussion. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. We have not seen this before, where no hard, tough exchange is permitted. And if you look at the presidential debate that took place, or rather the vice presidential debate uh, uh, between the two candidates, you could have seen that immediately. The lack of, of anything like a hard exchange is a very serious symptom. All right, well, this exchange, I'm afraid, will have to end. But thank you, Barbara Ehrenreich and Cornell West, Dorothy Rabinowitz, and Michael Novak. Thank you very much. Still to come on the news hour tonight, the youth vote, Shields and G. Go, plus Yeltsin surgery and the other news of this day. Now an election day story about one way to cope with voter apathy. It's called the family solution. There are cars for 96 cents a gallon. And in 40 states around the country, some 2 million kids took part in Kids Voting USA. After weeks of lively debate in their classroom, the kids got to accompany their parents to the polling places and place their own unofficial votes. When we come back, the last word on fixing America. That's bad. That's bad. Very, but I handled my thinning. It's diamond. Length of time after our operation for a bypass to uh, uh, continue to support the heart. And uh, in, in most of the studies that have been done in this regard, we can say that <clears throat> from 10 to 15 years after the operation, almost three fourths of the patient were leading a normal life. Mr. Victor Chernomirdin is the man in charge of day-to-day -day duties as well as Russia's huge nuclear arsenal. Chernomirdin visited Mr. Yeltsin earlier today and called President Clinton to let him know the Russian president is, in his words, doing well. 
O.J. Simpson's civil trial got a late start today. Lawyers spent considerable time in chambers with the judge after a newspaper reported an 18-year-old court intern accused Simpson of sexual harassment. Both Simpson and the intern now deny the report. She says Simpson did invite her to a Halloween party at the home of a friend, but she refused. Once trial resumed, criminalist Dennis Fung testified that preliminary tests done on Simpson's shower and bath... ...cold and sinus. ...that this was the president of Russia and just thought of him as a patient. But for 68 minutes, while Yeltsin's heart was stopped for repairs and he was kept alive on a heart and lung machine, the future of Russia hung in the balance. The operation was a complete success. Dr. Michael DeBakey, the Houston cardiologist who pioneered the bypass technique, was on hand today as a consultant. And on the basis of the results of this operation at the present time, I would predict that the President Yeltsin will be able to return to his office and carry out his duties in a perfectly normal fashion. Still, the first 24 hours of recovery are the most critical, and doctors won't know, Dan, for several days whether Boris Yeltsin is really out of the woods. Dan? Thanks, Richard. More election returns and analysis up next. Our last Exhilarate. Senator. Record or near record turnout. The fate of accused killer Jason Speaks is now in the hands of a Davenport jury. Speaks is one of four Missouri teens accused of killing Rebecca Hauser of rural Liscombe. Judge Carl Peterson gave the jurors their instructions shortly before noon and then sent them behind closed doors for deliberation. Two of the other teens charged in the case. <laughs> Here is where we elected the better man who led us to a better America, because here is where we elected Bob Dole. God. But goodbye, Shorty. You're counting son line one. The audit next Tuesday. Your wife's son two. And where's the dry cleaning? Yeah, where's the dry cleaning? Life getting a bit overwhelming. Try the simple thrill of an Accord Coupe from Honda. Bobby said he beat you. He's such a kidder. He wasn't kidding. Well, maybe he just got lucky. Three in a row? Well, maybe we need a new game plan. Introducing New Insure Light. Complete balanced nutrition. Number one doctor recommended. Low in fat and only 200 calories. Helps you stay healthy, active, energetic. I think I'm ready for another. Another Insure Light? Oh, another game. New Insure Light. Drink to your health. Have you tried multigrain Cheerios? I did that multi. Out oh, yeah. Fixing America tonight. And of course, now the votes are beginning to roll in. We'll have some important states closing in just a few moments. Tim will get some early clues, I would think, because we'll be hearing from the voters in Florida in Ohio and in Georgia. Those are three pivotal states in this election. Florida, Tom, a Democrat has not won since 1976. If Clinton... Hey, nine. ...voters have re-elected Republican Senator Mitch McConnell and a Democrat has been elected governor of Indiana. In just a few minutes at 7 Eastern Time, coming up here in just a moment, the polls will close in six more states, Florida, Georgia, Virginia, South Carolina, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And we'll have returns from them just after the top of the hour. There's a lot more to our CBS News election coverage still to come. I'll be back in a couple of minutes as our CBS News election team here around the table begins continuous live coverage of the election returns plus analysis. For the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather, see you again in a moment. Factual re Seven in the metro area, but those 30 degree temperatures are on the way. A Dava 13 forecast for today, mostly cloudy skies with a high of 57. For tonight, mostly cloudy, a low of 47. And your exclusive Dava 13 seven day forecast, rain for Wednesday, and then we'll cool up and dry off for the end of the week. And your highlighted weekend, warmer with rain on Sunday and Monday. That's your forecast. The results are in.
Consumers Digest's best buys for 1996 are Dodge Caravan, Dodge Stratus, Dodge Neon, and Dodge Avenger. And now at Stu Hansen's Dodge City, our best buy celebration means qualified buyers get interest rates as low as 1.9% or rebates up to $1,000 on Stratus, Neon, and Avenger. It just doesn't get any better than this. Your best buy is at Stu Hansen's Dodge City at the corner of Ingersoll and ML King Parkway under the giant stars and stripes. Just a few minutes from everywhere. Expose. To art. Expose yourself to art. Two Rivers Art Expo. Original art. From 150 artists. Working in wood, clay, and glass. Fiber, metal, and oil. Great food, live music, and artist demonstrations. Decorator tips, hands-on art workshop for kids, and gourmet gift shop. Two Rivers Art Expo. Saturday and Sunday, November 9th and 10th. At the Des Moines Convention Center. Adults $5, children 12 and under free. Two Rivers Art Expo. Expose yourself. To art. To art. Good evening, CNN Headline News. I'm Lynn Russell. Who lives in the White House and who controls Congress are on the line as the early results of Election 96 begin pouring in. Polls still are open in most of the country, but all the ballots are in now for nine states. Chuck Roberts is following the numbers from our election desk. And Chuck, together again for a general election, what do we know so far? I hope you're well provisioned. It's going to be a long night, Lynn. It's very early, obviously. The state's weighing in so far. All together account for only 89 of the 270 electoral votes needed by either President Clinton or Republican Bob Dole to win the White House. Let's look quickly at how things are shaping up so far, if we can go to those winter boards. First of all, the president will carry Florida. The first time uh, in quite a while a Democrat has carried Florida, but he will win 25 electoral votes and will carry Florida. That is a pickup. As you know, George Bush won two times and Ronald Reagan two times in Florida. Moving on. In New Hampshire, the president will win there as well. Four electoral votes at stake. The president easily carrying New Hampshire, which is now going back to the center. It had been a strong Republican, a Republican stronghold for many, many years. And also in Vermont, he will win next door. So Vermont goes for President Clinton as well. There's the Georgia race still undecided. There are 13 electoral votes in Georgia. It's also still undecided in South Carolina next door. If we could move on to that one. No returns. I think Vermont will be up next. And again, that's called for President Clinton. He will carry those three electoral votes. Virginia is still too close to call. And so is Kentucky, where the polls have been closed for an hour now. Too close to call in Kentucky, 46, 46, and 8 is the early spread. Bob Dole's back in Washington monitoring the election returns, saying he hopes to have a victory celebration. He voted this morning in his hometown of Russell, Kansas, and told supporters there he's given this campaign his all. He says no matter what happens, he's looking forward to the future. President Clinton cast his vote today in Little Rock and emerged with a hug and a high five for daughter Chelsea. Aides say the president is happy and confident as the vote count gets underway. Ross Perot's second run for the White House stumbled four years ago, and his bid to put the Reform Party front and center in U.S. politics also failed. Tony Clark explains why. When Ross Perot cast his ballot Tuesday, it was the culmination of a 13-month journey to create a new party and challenge the Democrats and Republicans on their own turf. How do you feel the election's going to go? Well, we'll find out tonight. Perot spent $8 million of his own money to create the Reform Party, but that's only a fraction of the $64 million he spent running as an independent candidate four years ago. Though Perot got what he wanted, a new political party and a position on the ballot in all 50 states, the rest of his campaign never took off. From his dealings with Reform Party rival Dick Lamb to his exclusion from the presidential debates. And I can't tell you how much your great spirit means to me. The crowds at Perot's rallies were small compared to those he attracted four years ago, and his recent string of stinging attacks on President Clinton and Democratic Party fundraising only slightly boosted his standing in the polls. Perot made one last push to attract undecided voters. He called it saturation bombing, buying $2 million of primetime television for an election eve assault on President Clinton. Why would you even consider voting for someone who doesn't keep his promises, doesn't tell the truth, and has serious criminal charges pending against him? 
Make history with your vote tomorrow. Working together, all of the corrupt campaign money in the world can't stop us. Of course, the real suspense tonight may lay in what happens in the Senate and House. Democrats are trying to regain control of both chambers. There are 34 Senate seats up for grabs. Democrats have to take three to regain control. CNN has declared a couple of races. Republican incumbent Mitch McConnell, the easy winner in Kentucky. In Georgia's race to succeed retiring Democrat Senator Sam Nunn, the first returns are just in. The polls closed about five minutes ago. And, of course, uh, Max Cleland, the Secretary of State, is running against businessman Guy Milner uh, in Georgia. The early numbers uh, show no clear favorite there. We do have a winner in New Hampshire where Dick Sweat will unseat uh, the, uh, the incumbent there, Bob Smith. Dick Sweat uh, was the US rep ex-U.S. representative who lost his House seat in 1994. Uh, losing its reliable G GOP tilt is New Hampshire. Uh, he voted for the weapons ban. That was an issue in the race. But Bob Smith will be kicked out of Congress. He voted for pay raises after promising not to. The new Senator Dick Sweat from New Hampshire. In South Carolina, 93-year-old Strom Thurmond running for his seventh full term in the Senate. He's been declared the winner. He's been a senator since 1954. And it's the battle of the Warners, of course, in Virginia. Mark and John, John Warner, the incumbent. John Warner is expected to win re-election. We have no vote totals to give you as of yet. In the House, the race for the 10th District, Indiana, is still too close to call. It pits Democrat Julia Carson against Republican Virginia Blankenbaker. Republicans may pick up a seat, though, in the 3rd District of Kentucky, where Republican... A number of voters could cast ballots today. To get an idea of how it's looking here in Polk County, I have the director of the elections here, Michael Morrow. What are you hearing back from your polling sites? Turnout has been heavy, been steady all day long. I think a typical presidential election year for us. Could you see a record turnout here in Polk County? I don't know. I think we'll, uh, four years ago we saw 170,000 voters. I don't think we'll see that many this time, but it's going to be a heavy turnout. Now, we were talking earlier, you mentioned you have seen a record number of absentees. Right, the absentees at an all-time record, 31,500 absentee requests. I think a lot of those people voted absentee would have went to the polls anyway, so I, it's going to be hard to forecast. It's a good turnout, I can tell you that. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Michael Morrow, the Director of Elections here in Polk County. We will be following a number of races here and have reports for you throughout the evening. Reporting live from the Polk County Election Office, Julie Kraft, News 5. All right, thank you, Julie. And for more on the candidates, let's go to Tom Cox. He is at Democratic Party headquarters at the downtown Des Moines Embassy Suites Hotel. Tom? Well, we are with the Democrats. There aren't very many here right now. They're getting out the vote, but one very important Democrat today is with me right now, Connie McBurney, candidate for the 4th Congressional District. The obvious question right now, now, any nerves? How do you feel? It's all wait and see at this point, but we've been out all day. <clears throat> Started off welcoming the early shift to work at about a quarter to six this morning. Then we went to uh, Winterset for breakfast, then went out to another three counties. And uh, you never know what to expect. It's been just amazing. We just talked with some people at the Democratic office in Pottawatomie County, and that's a very important part of the 4th District. And they said the highest number of volunteers they've ever had, and 80% the Democratic vote has turned out in Pottawatomie County. That's uh -huh. amazing. You hope that's a bellwether. My question is, in the last few days of the campaign, you, you unveiled a fairly aggressive campaign against your opponent. Any strategy there? I got into this race for one reason. I was working with kids and health care for families and communities, and the votes that were coming in from Washington were working against us. And I got in to represent the people of Iowa who live here and who care about their future. And that strategy hasn't changed. Okay, thank you very much, Kai McBurney. We'll obviously be following your race. And, of course, Senator Tom Harkin here from the Democratic headquarters. But right now we're going to throw it to Lena Vanier, who's standing by at Republican headquarters. That's right, Tom. We are live at the Hotel Fort Des Moines election night headquarters for Jim Ross Lightfoot and Greg Gansky. And the Republicans are pretty fired up tonight. And they're fired up for a number of reasons. Now, in the 4th District, incumbent Greg Gansky is facing a stiff challenge from newcomer Connie McBurney, as you just heard. And Gansky shown here here voting earlier today. Uh, recent polls have him in the lead by only a few percentage points. Republicans are also fired up tonight because in the race for the U.S. Senate challenger, Jim Ross Lightfoot is closing the gap. Now, in incumbent Tom Harkin is only enjoying a single-digit lead. Compare, compare that to less than two months ago when Harkin had a 31-point lead over Lightfoot. Now, joining me live is Monte Shaw. He is the deputy campaign manager for the Lightfoot campaign. Now, Monte, what are the um, chances tonight that
that we'll be seeing an upset here in the uh, U.S. Senate race. Well, we feel very good about our chances here tonight. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, this campaign has just seemed to gel and hit all on, on all cylinders. And uh, from the numbers that we saw in our tracking and from the preliminary results uh, that we hear from exit polls, we feel very good about where we're at right now. Okay, thanks a lot, Monty. We will hear more from you probably later tonight. Thanks Reporting so. live from the Hotel Fort Des Moines, Lena Vanier, back to you. All right, thank you, Lena. And we have some of the latest results in now from out east. President Clinton has won Florida, New Hampshire, and Vermont. All right, that could be a trend. And in Dallas County, voters are tipping their cards on the hotly debated gaming referendum. A yes vote would be the first step toward putting a riverboat casino on Clearwater Lake. News 5's Don Taylor is covering the polls in Dallas County. Don, what's happening? Well, I'm standing in front of the Dallas County Supervisor's Office where the votes will all be counted tonight. Residents must decide whether to say yes or no to riverboat gambling. Now, Casino America wants to put a $70 million complex at Clearwater Lake. It would be a hotel, casino, pavilion, and three restaurants. One benefit Casino America is pushing is that they say they will pay 3 to $4 million a year to the county. Now, opponents of the facility have started the Don't Float the Boat group. Um, they've been fighting Casino America. They say they're worried about the gambling's impact on the county. They're skeptical about the number of jobs that will be created. And they're worried about the property tax burdens for the community. So that's the riverboat race. There's two other races we're going to be following here. Sheriff Art Johnson, the incumbent in the sheriff's office, is running against his own deputy. Kelly Sutton is not on the ballot, but he is waging a write-in campaign. And in the treasurer's race, Marilyn Gleam is versing Dar is versus Daryl Bauman in the treasurer's race. So we're going to have all those results from Dallas County. This is Don Taylor reporting live from Adele. All right. Thank you, Don. And now we're joined by News 5 political analyst Jeff Stein. Jeff will be with us throughout our election coverage. Jeff, give us an idea. What can we expect tonight in your opinion? Well, Sonia, the, the fact that we have such heavy voter turnout with races tightening as these uh, last few weeks have come by, not only in the presidential race in Iowa, but also the U.S. Senate race and especially the 3rd and 4th Congressional District. So the heavy turnout means those folks who have finally been tuning in in these last few weeks are starting to show up and that could bode well for the folks who have been behind. I mean, for Lightfoot to be 30 points behind in the polls and now to be within striking distance is just amazing if he can pull that off. Now, is that the most interesting race from your perspective, the, the Lightfoot-Harkin race? It's becoming that way, Mike, but I think one of the things we also want to look at will be the state Senate races. The Republicans are hoping to pick up three seats so that they can have a majority in the state Senate, and we'll be watching that dynamic as the night goes on as well. Any predictions at this early, <laughs> early uh, juncture of the evening? Sometime after 9 o'clock, we'll have some numbers. That's the only prediction it would be safe to make at this juncture. I'll, I'll go out no further on any limb than that. Now, you had some early predictions, though, about Lightfoot Harkin. You said he has really closed the gap in the last couple of days. Yeah, the uh, polling on both sides, Republican and Democratic uh, polling, shows that it's plus or minus a few points either way. And so that is a... Without ever stating that this is my strategy, he was mm -hmm. trying to elect a Democratic majority in the Senate. I'll be interested and to see if, like Paul, if his coattails, especially in the Northeast, uh, are, uh, are real. And uh, quickly, I mean, the House, there's, it's going to take all night to figure that one out, isn't it? Isn't that, I mean, everything I have seen at least, so that's going to be really close. Yeah. It's going to go all the way down. Yeah, the two states to watch there, I think, are the early returns in Kentucky and Indiana. Uh, if the Republicans end up gaining a seat in each of those states, it looks like they'll retain their majority. All right. Thank you both very much. See you later. For a long time. <laughs> And speaking of results, we have some first returns now from election 96. Kwame Holman has them. Jim, what we have are the earliest of the early returns, and they begin in the state of Kentucky. As, as Paul mentioned, uh, we have a projected winner in the Senate race in Kentucky. Mitch McConnell, the two-term Republican senator from Kentucky, has been projected to win re-election in the state of Kentucky. Moving on to um, another race in Kentucky, in Kentucky's second district, where uh, David McIntosh uh, is the incumbent going against uh, Mark Carmichael. Um, um, and then, uh, and I don't have the, the exact uh, numbers, the numbers you can see on your screen there. And then to District 3 in Kentucky, where Democratic incumbent Tim Romer is going against Joe Zakis, the Republican. And um, in Kentucky's sixth congressional district, where incumbent Dan Burton um, is going against uh, Carrie Dillard Trammell, the uh, the uh, Democratic opponent there. 
Now going on to the Indiana governor's race, um, where Frank O'Bannon, the Democrat lieutenant governor of Indiana, is going against Stephen Goldsmith, the mayor of Indianapolis. And um, moving on to Indiana's third congressional district, uh, where, uh, I'm sorry, that's the, that's the Tim Romer race with, with Joe Zakis in Indiana's third. And um, moving on to Indiana's 10th congressional district, where Virginia Blankenbaker um, is going for an open seat in an open seat race against Julia Carson. Uh, then moving on to the New Hampshire, New Hampshire Senate race, where Senator Bob Smith is going against former Congressman Dick Sweat with 1% of the uh, vote total in so far. And um, also in New Hampshire's first congressional district where uh, John Sununu, uh, the son of John, of John Sununu, the former White House uh, uh, chief of staff. And um, if we have those national totals up for you, take a look. And uh, we will be back uh, with more uh, throughout the night. Now on to some non-U.S. election news. Boris Yeltsin's heart surgery. We begin with a report from Lawrence McDonnell of Independent Television News. After months of speculation about when and if the operation would go ahead, this morning while Moscow slept, the Russian president was delivered from sanatorium to surgery. Ahead he faced seven hours in theater that would decide not just his survival, but the fate of the nation. Chief Heart Surgeon Renat Akchurin looked tense even before the operation began. It was hardly surprising. In a clinic on the outskirts of Moscow, Mr. Yeltsin's heart was switched off for some two hours while doctors worked to improve the flow of blood to his vital organs. This afternoon, the surgeons emerged to announce the operation a success. Everything had gone according to plan. There were no complications, commented Dr. Akchorin, and all the signs are that the heart will now be able to function properly. And the chief consultant on the team was confident enough to expect a full recovery. I would predict that the President Yeltsin will be able to return to his office and carry out his duties in a perfectly normal fashion. Just before he went into surgery, Boris Yeltsin signed a decree handing over power temporarily to his Prime Minister, Viktor Chernomyrdin, including control over the country's armed forces and its nuclear arsenal. As he sped into Moscow this morning, Viktor Chernomyrdin was acting head of state, the most powerful figure in the country. He'll remain acting president until Mr. Yeltsin is well enough to return to office. Elizabeth Farnsworth has more. For more about the surgery, we are joined by Dr. Robert Jones, a cardiac surgeon and the chief medical officer at Duke University Medical Center. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Jones. I believe, I believe you have a diagram. Using the diagram, would you explain the heart surgery that Boris Yeltsin just went through? Yes, the view on the diagram would be the same view as the cardiac surgeon had before the chest was closed about 12 hours ago. I think the major difference is that Mr. Yeltsin appeared to have had more grafts than are shown, but the tubes that are seen in this uh, illustration are similar to those that Mr. Yeltsin had and are pieces of vein from the skin of the leg that is sewn in one end uh, to the source of good oxygenated blood, the aorta, and then below where the blockages are into the branches of the coronary tree. The surgery apparently took seven hours. Some reports are saying it was a quintuple bypass. Does that sound about, about right to you, seven hours to do a quintuple bypass? Uh, I think the times that were quoted were the entire times in the operating room. I think the actual operating time from the time the incision was first made until it was closed was a bit less. Uh, usually to do five grafts uh, would take close to four hours. Dr. DeBakey made it sound like he'll bounce back pretty quickly. How long do you think his recuperation will take? I think Dr. Bakey is very correct. Uh, usually you would expect a patient to spend one night in an acute care environment and uh, in this country uh, four or five additional